Hello everybody! The Grand Chess Tour started today in Paris featuring some of the strongest chess players in the world. The event is uh, shared in two parts. First we'll have the Rapid and then the Blitz. And since the tournament already started today, uh, five rounds have been played. Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura are currently leading the Rapid with three and a half out of five, but five more rounds um, are to be, uh, sorry, not five, four more rounds are to be played tomorrow, so it's definitely going to be an exciting day. Um, of course, with this event taking place, I've decided to choose a game from there for today's video, and the one I chose is between Maxime Vachelagrave and Magnus Carlsen. I believe this game is going to be uh, giving you a little bit more insight in the real Lopez. Let's get started. Knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castle. And in this position, the most played move is bishop e7. The idea is if black plays b5 too early, white will have the opportunity of, of course, pl after playing bishop b3, playing a4 and forcing black to do something about this pawn, whether they allow the trade or they push before is of course their decision, but if you black does push before then this knight will be able to um, be recycled to get to c4, which of course is a really nice spot for white's knight. Um, but of course there are pluses for black as well, by playing b5 first before bishop e7, Black is going to develop their bishop to b7 and then put some pressure on e4, like that, forcing white to take some stance about the pawn and protect it, and then is going to slow them down from playing d4. And this is the choice of Magnus's. Now, in this position, white has a lot of choices, uh, some of which are rook e1 to protect the pawn or d3. But of course, uh, if white plays d3, it's going to take a little bit longer to try to play d4. Another possibility is to play c3 and give this e4 pawn. d4 is a move that used to be played some time back, but um, it seems like d4 doesn't really give white advantage, so um, white has better moves that would keep a slight advantage. And then knight c3, which is the move chosen by Maxime. Um, what I want to discuss with you is d4. Why is this why this move isn't played that much by white anymore? And it's not because e d4, because after e d4, white goes e5, and after knight e4, bishop d5. The knight has to go to c5, and then white can recapture in d4. Um, white, black's knights are plays that greatly and uh, for example now you know you need to do something about this um, the spin here so if black captures in d4 simply bishop takes b7 knight takes b7 queen takes d4 and um, black's pieces are not placed that greatly in fact he's underdeveloped and this knight in b7 is really not on the best square and it's going to take some time to get it back into play. This pawn in e5 is definitely a strong piece of white and is restricting black from finishing their development. So of course not, like I said, e takes d4, but knight takes d4. And now, um, of course, uh, this move would be bad for white because of knight takes b3. A takes b3 and now bishop d6. The bishop is going to be very nicely placed for a potential attack. And uh, black is going to win a pawn after knight takes e4, the next move. So after knight takes d4, the move that white um, could believe that would lead to advantage would be bishop takes f7. It's very important to look for tactical ideas. King takes. Now knight takes e5, king g8, and queen takes d4. And it might seem like in this position white has the advantage because, uh, well, the king is uncastled and uh, black isn't really very much developed. But after c5, chasing the queen away, 
and then queen e8, black seems to be doing totally fine as this e4 pawn is going to be hanging and then black will have the center, they have the bishop pair, this bishop is going to be developed in d6, so black doesn't have many problems. And that is the reason why in this position, white doesn't go for d4 anymore, although that's the main idea uh, in the real Lopez. So, um, okay, let's see this knight c3. The other moves are, of course, uh, would be leading to um, interesting interesting positions. Like I said, rook e1 is one of the main lines, and uh, here it's very important to know that um, bishop c5 is one of the best continuations. Bishop e7 is a little bit passive, and white could continue their plan with c3, d4. And in case you're deciding to play d5 and go for the advantage, you're not really going for any advantage here because after capture, knight takes d5, there's knight takes e5, and rook takes. And even after knight f4, there's d4. And so although it looks like black might be having some attack on the king side, it is in fact him that would have to be very careful. They currently have a pawn down with a king in the center and uh, a knight hanging in f4 as well. It is of course not that great to capture the pawn in g2 because that's it, you're just capturing a pawn and now you have to be very careful about your king in the center. So I'm sure Magnus wouldn't have gone for this, um, this d5 idea but instead most likely would have played bishop c5 and after c3, d6, and if d4, bishop b6, and um, the play would be, um, you know, reasonable for black with counterplay. There's nothing to be f uh, fearful about. Well, anyways, Maxim went for knight c3, and here Magnus chose bishop e7. Now, you have to be careful. What's the idea of this knight c3? Well, first of all, we're protecting e4, and then, of course, we keep in mind this possibility of playing a4 and after b4, knight d5. So, black has to be careful of where they're going to develop the bishop. If bishop c5 in this position, d3, and after castle, this is the moment where black, um, where, sorry, where white could go knight d5, for example. And black has to be very careful. They cannot just go d6 because of this bishop g5 pin. So that is the reason why it is better to develop the bishop in e7, making sure with black that we are avoiding any bishop g5 pins and losing material. Okay, d3, castle. And uh, in this position the most played move for white is actually bishop d2. And it was played um, the last time in 2015 in Las Vegas by uh, a 2400 player against Gregory Kaitanov who reacted here with simply d6. Now that the bishop is in e7 there's no need to fear bishop g5. And after a4 it's important to keep the pawn there. Knight a5. This is a nice move that you know, avoids, for example, if if black capture, if white captures, black captures in b3, pawn takes, now a takes b5, trade, queen takes, and capturing this pawn wouldn't be in white's adv advantage because now there's queen a6, and this pawn is going to fall, after which white has to be careful about the other weaknesses, these double pawns and this pawn in e4, so bishop a2 ha would have to be played and now b4 and after knight d5 black is okay to give away the bishop in d5 and after e takes d5 rook b8 this position is about equal so maxim went for a3 avoiding b4 so not going for that a4 idea and here um magnus played this position before and he went for d6 and it wasn't an old game it was in fact a recent game which he played um, against um, um, Fabiano Caruana in San Luis last year and he ended up winning that game but for this game he went for knight d4 which I, I like a little bit more 
Hmm. And here, three possibilities come to mind for white. And of course, they have been played before. Bishop a2 to try to save the bishop. Capturing in d4 and capturing in e5. I would like to start by the capture in e5 to see, you know, it looks like black is giving away a pawn, why won't we take it? And if you remember my video from yesterday, I was mentioning to you how Viktor Korchno is taking all the pawns unless he sees that there is a clear trap which is going to make him lose the game, so why not capture here? Well, the reason is that now black takes the bishop pair, pawn takes, and he now makes a really good move, d5. And opens up this, the center, and of course, black wants to open up the center because they have the bishop pair. So these bishops, with a bishop in d6 and this one in b7, they are looking at the king with possibilities of creating some nice attacks. White captures in d5, what to do? We, we want to take in e4. And here knight takes d5. And um, if white goes for d4, this move simply keeps the, the game equal. Although white does have a pawn up, these three pawns are basically like two. Uh, white will never be able to create a passed pawn, and so these pawns are going to stop those. And uh, after capture, bishop takes c5. Black has no trouble. They have enough compensation, although, like I said, it doesn't even look like they have a pawn down, and these bishops are going to create some nice attacks. Even if you decide to go for knight takes d5, I'm not going to trade the queens just yet. I'm going to capture with the bishop, and, like I said, black has nothing to fear. So, that's one possibility. Another one would have been bishop a2, and in that case, um, Simply, knight takes f3 check, and after queen takes, black can prepare um, to try to play d5 by continuing here with c6. Now, of course, if white goes queen g3 to attack this pawn, we cannot go for d5. We have to settle for d6, um, but this position um, seems quite equal, it doesn't seem like white has a big plan to win. And, you know, in these rapid tournaments, anything can happen, so it's good to complicate the position because the time will not be sufficient for the opponent to calculate every single thing. So I believe that is the reason why Maxime decided to kind of, let's say, um, you know, make this choice. e takes d4, knight d5. In this position, knight e2 has been um, tried by a 2300 player, but after c5, if white goes c3, simply d5. Again, opening up the position and trying to get these two bishops to play. It seems like this position is totally fine for black. Maxim went for knight d5, takes, pawn takes. Now if bishop takes d5, it would lead to another equality after bishop takes, pawn takes, f5. This was tried between um, Gara Ticia and Natalia Zhukova, two very strong female chess players. And the game ended in a draw. It's really about equal. Um, both of these pawns are weak are eventually going to be traded and although black could try to create some attacks on the king side it won't be sufficient to win the game most likely. Uh, Maxim decided to keep the bishop on the board which I believe wasn't the best choice because this bishop in b3 although it might seem strong on the diagonal is currently closed by its own pawn, so even if you close this bishop too, you know, maybe you're better off getting rid of, of your bishop. Specifically because here, Magnus went for c5. I like this move a lot because it gets rid of the double pawns, and suddenly now after the trade pawn takes, we realize that black has more space advantage, of course given this d4 pawn versus this d3 pawn, and this bishop in b3 doesn't do very much, and in fact, c5, c4 seems like a really nice plan for black. 
So uh, you see why it would have been better to trade that bishop. When you start playing chess and you're focusing on the Italian or or the Ri Lopez, you learn that this bishop on the g8 a2 diagonal is very strong and often creates threats in f7, like I showed you earlier this game, possible sacrifices in f7, um, or winning that pawn sometimes without the sacrifice. But other times that bishop can be um, in in white's detriment because it doesn't it sometimes gets closed up and uh, it would be better not to have it than to have it and this is exactly what happened here um, to Maxime rookie one c5 and here um, I believe white should have gone for bishop f4 it's time to finish up the development and not only that it's it's very important not to allow black to place their bishop in d6 and queen in c7 because those are the best spots for, for the bishop and queen. Looking at h2, forcing you to at some point, you know, push g3 maybe and weaken your h1 a8 diagonal, which of course is going to be great for black because queen c6 is just one move away and then the mate is right there. So... Bishop f4, I believe, would have been necessary here. However, once again, because of that pawn in b3, black could continue here, rook to c8, and um, get ready to eventually play c4 and restrict that light square bishop even more. Um, so, after c5, however, Maxim decided to go for a4. This seems like a typical move, right? I mentioned to you earlier, when black plays b5 too early, it allows for a4 and trying to force trades or a push in b4. Here, however, there is no forcing. The knights are off the board, so there is no pressure on b5. Black is not forced to do anything about that pawn. So Magnus is just improving his position. Bishop d6. Now, of course, there are possibilities of queen h4 or queen c7. There's no need to worry about the b5 pawn. Queen h5. Now, if queen g4 would have been played, of course, there's a little trick there with bishop h6, but there's no need to worry for black. After queen c7, if white goes for bishop h6, there's simply capture. King goes to h1, and now bishop back to e5. Protecting g7. Black has a pawn up and can continue the game. So Maxim went for queen h5. Now queen c7, finishing the development. And here suddenly, white from, you know, when you start the game, white has a slight advantage. It starts being obvious that black has won with, with, with this pawn structure pointing in that direction and being restrictive. Now this bishop in c1 really has trouble finding a nice spot to develop to, and to do something. And here, um, Maxim made a mistake, went for c3. The idea of this move is, of course, to try to open the long diagonal and develop the bishop in b2 and give a sense to that bishop. And we're going to see in a second why this was a mistake. Instead, I considered bishop d5, or a takes b5, and then bishop uh, well, capture the rooks and then bishop d5 as an answer for white in this position. Um, because that bishop really needs to be traded. It doesn't do much and in fact is going to allow that c4. So I, I couldn't make up my mind whether bishop d5 immediately or capture first, rook takes and bishop d5. Even if white gives away that pawn in h2, queen takes h2, trade of the queens, now bishop takes d5, at least there's opposite color bishops and there is, um, it, you know, a big chance for white to be able to save this uh, position compared to the other opposite color bishops which we have seen two days ago in a game played by my mother, which inspired me very much. 
Um, this is different. Black doesn't have a pass pawn just yet, and by the time you're gonna make one, it's going to take a really long time. And white is quite active. Their rook gets to e5, and if you go rook d8, white can play rook e7. Keep the rook active, and of course, um, get the bishop into play as well. This was definitely a safe bet for white, even if um, white would have to play with a pawn down. After c3, I would like you to pause the video and try to find a solution here for black. The amazing move that Magnus found is c4. And this is a typical idea that we see when there are two pawns on the same line, if they are behind enough um, and the opponent can come with the second pawn on the next to it line. Um, it always creates nice tactical ideas because regardless of, of uh, where white would capture, black would capture on the other side and then there's going to be a pass pawn uh, going for the queen. Now of course here um, white cannot take in d4 right? because the bishop is hanging too. If they would choose to capture here simply b takes e4, the bishop would have to go somewhere and then d3. Black has a protected pass pawn about to promote. White is still underdeveloped and they have just killed their bishop in a2 as well. So after c4, Maxim found the only move, bishop c2, supposedly keeping the position safe. Any captures will be responded with a capture back. But here, Magnus played g6, avoiding any threats on h7 because that bishop comes into play as well by playing bishop c2. Now there's a threat to capture and then h7, so g6. The queen has to go back and now d takes c3. b takes c3 probably would have been the last chance to try to hold on to the position a little bit more. Um, and now after c takes d3, bishop takes, queen takes c3, trying to get the bishop active. Um, but of, of course, white cannot hope for very much here because this, uh, this diagonal will never be, um, getting into white's, uh, hands. The queen is already here. Anytime there will be a queen retreat if necessary. Uh, for the moment, just rook eight starting to trade pieces and try to win with the pawn out. But instead of b takes c3, Maxim captured in b5. And after rook f to e8, threatening mate on the last rank, rook e3, capturing b2, forced to take back, and now c3. That bishop is going to be dead as well. As you notice, black's pieces are all coordinated, they work together, they help push the pawns, whereas white's pieces are all over the board, they don't seem to work together, or if they did, they didn't make enough. Uh, counterplay for white. Now after capture, rook takes a8, rook takes a8, bishop b3, trying some threats, but what exactly? Simply bishop f4, skewering the rook and bishop. White had to retreat, and after rook a1, black is simply going to win another piece, and then of course um, promote their pawn. I really hope you enjoyed this game and it was uh, insightful in the Rui Lopez in this particular line. I'm looking forward to analyzing more games from this Grand Chess Tour. Until tomorrow, have a beautiful day and see you soon. Bye!